Hello friends of YouTube, welcome to Mike Reads the World, and today we're talking about a novel by the New Zealand writer Janet Frame and her novel Owls Do Cry. Now this was written in, I believe, 1960, or published in 1960, and I have to right away talk about how interesting the life story of this author is. She never did win a Nobel Prize, which uh, some are surprised at, and um, personally I'm surprised by how, for being one of New Zealand's like first great literary you know, writers, uh, there's very little out there of people discussing her or talking about this book or really any of her books, and yet it does seem to have a special place in the Oceania and New Zealand literary canon. Um, Janet Frame essentially was, uh, was misdiagnosed with schizophrenia and actually scheduled to have a, a brain surgery, a, a, I believe a, f a frontal lobotomy, which they did back then, you know, and which now is obviously shocking. We consider it shocking and like an inhumane way to treat mental illness. Um, but back then it was practice and she was only saved because uh, her collection of short stories won New Zealand's uh, premier fiction prize. Wow, like what a story. And Owls Do Cry, while not supposedly exactly autobiographical, Janet Frame does have an autobi autobiographical works out there if you want to read about her specific story, but this was like her first novel after this event, after, you know, after her uh, lobotomy or, or brain surgery was canceled uh, and um, she was allowed to continue her life writing. Um, uh, she wrote this novel and it obviously has a lot of her life in it. Um, it follows a family, the Withers family, through the course of about 30 years, which is uh, a bit deceptive to say actually because really what it is is um, the the years like five through ten years old and then it skips 20 years into the future uh, so the first part of the book is like childhood and then the s second part of the book is 20 years in the future so it's kind of in two sections like that um, this withers family Everybody in the family seems to struggle on some level with mental illness throughout the book, uh, or or some kind of illness. Like, um, there's not really a narrator, but the character Daphne is probably pretty close to an insert for the author, and um, I I don't want to give away like the major beats of the story. That's that's what I don't like about. Even some of the um, summaries of this story is they just give away major beats. So, like, if you even Google this novel, it's going to tell you a major thing about the story. Um, and possibly, too, if you read a little bit further. I'm going to try not to do that at all. Um, so, growing up, she has um, another sister, Francie, and another sister, well, two, two sisters, and another sister, Chicks. Um, and again, all of them struggle with mental illness in a different way, and uh, what happens to them kind of manifests itself in a different way. Ch um, uh, Francie is compared to Joan of Arc, and, uh, and her trajectory is towards a tragedy. I'm not going to say exactly what that tragedy is, uh, but it defines in many ways the rest of the story. And then Chicks is kind of like the one that leads the most normal life out of all of them. But there's a point in the story where the brother, who has epileptic fits throughout his life, finds the diary of Chicks, and uh, we get some insight into how she's a bit crazy in her normalcy too, like in her pursuit of normalcy. 
So that's a very interesting angle as well. All the, 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 and the parents, um, Bill Withers and, uh, I think Amy Withers is the mom's name. They, they both, uh, have their own struggles as well. Um, yeah, they're all really interesting characters, all really well developed and obviously based on people in, uh, in Daphne or Janet Frame's life, Janet Frame's life, um, I think Daphne's the insert for her, but, um, that's, that's why I think they're so real, is because they, they come to life because they're based on real people, and you really do feel that. I felt it as I read the book. Uh, the other thing I was gonna say about that is, oh yeah, the, the, the style of this novel is very close to okay the first thing i thought of uh, as far as the books that i've read for this project so far was portrait of the artist as a young man it's very much in the james joyce modernist style a uh, stream of consciousness you kind of hop back and forth between you know uh, a narrator who like the narrator knows everything right but uh, the narrator like is omniscient, third person omniscient, but it, it hops between perspectives. And a, a good example of this is uh, chapter 22 tells about a dream that Toby has um, about his sisters. And then at the beginning of chapter 23, it says, in the morning, he did not remember his dreams. For like most dreams, his memory of it ended with, I dreamt something last night. I don't know what, it was queer, something about a telescope and a pie. I think it was an apple pie cooking in the oven, in an oven. And it was, of course, not that at all. But uh, it's, um, and you can tell the language is a little bit antiquated. You know, this is, it was written in the 1950s. Uh, but that does not make it less understandable. What does make it a little bit confusing is the hopping perspective. So for the first, like, few chapters of the book, I was kind of like, and it's not a long book, by the way, it's uh, 200 pages, fairly large text. Um, I think I got through it maybe in five sittings or so uh, over the course of six, seven days. So it's uh, one you can kind of pick up, put back down. It is, I think, more effective if you read, read it quickly. I wish I would have read it a little bit quicker because every time I picked it back up, I kind of had to remember, okay, who's who, this kind of thing. But um, it wasn't that bad. Uh, but the stream of consciousness does make it a little hard to follow, especially in the beginning because you don't know what it's leading to. So I do encourage if you're put off a little bit by the first four or five chapters, you're like, okay, I don't get where this is going. It's a little bit confusing about who's who and the stream of consciousness jumping around. Keep going. Have some perseverance. It is rewarded. At least it was for me because that's how I felt. And I did feel that there was some really great payoffs in this book and some really emotionally affecting moments. It didn't quite bring me to tears, you know, but it's it's a there's sad moments in this book and there's really thoughtful and profound moments that make you feel it's good and and i i think i mean maybe on a different day or had i had a different you know a certain experience in my life that really resonated with this maybe it could have brought me to tears some really moving stuff in here um it ended a bit more abruptly than i expected i actually expected a little bit more out of the ending but i won't get into that i don't want to spoil anything um, that being said, yeah, the, the middle portion was actually my favorite, uh, which follows Toby and, uh, the parts about Toby and chicks were the ones I related to the most. And depending on your experience in your, in, in life and your personal experience, perhaps with mental illness, yourself, somebody you knew, different characters in the book are probably going to resonate with different people more strongly in different parts of the book. And your age could could have an impact on that as well. The the aging process of all the characters is quite important. And all and um, for example, Toby being uh, thirty some years old in the second part of the book versus when he was younger, 
and you can see his kind of struggle to mature into a functioning adult um and chicks kind of judging him for that and chicks kind of like having this normal life and whatever that obviously is the part that resonated most with me and i thought was most interesting um and and then you have um yeah bill and amy withers and how they deal with aging and um their their children's lives kind of not turning out so great in some aspects and them not really coming to terms with what their life has meant and 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 trying to and and um amy and bill of course are really deep characters that just by their situation that i haven't lived yet and i haven't been there yet um i couldn't understand as well but i still found it moving and very apparently realistic and uh and haunting and thoughtful so again good book very modernist style james think james joyce but a little bit more james joyce light you know it's not as maybe maybe uh it's not quite as obviously layered and and in depth in in the way that um portrait of the artist as a young man is it doesn't have like political undertones or anything like that but it's a very emotionally and i think philosophically deep work and i think resonate would probably resonate with people who consider themselves neurodivergent as well um which uh i don't know if i'm in that camp but that's another thing maybe i don't know i still resonated with a lot of stuff in there in here uh and also i think it could resonate with um, yeah, any, anyone who enjoys the modernist literature, really, that style of the stream of consciousness, so. Other than that, like, again, I don't want to spoil a lot of stuff. Uh, the beautiful, there's beautiful language. I didn't really talk about the writing itself, except that it's in that stream of consciousness and that third person omniscient, um, narrator. There's some beautiful descriptions of, like, the geographical place of New Zealand. There's references to how the seasons are reversed, you know, obviously being there, and some of the geography, and how in the south the sky feels more oppressive because you're closer to the Antarctica. Um, I always am, am very lazy about, like, saving parts of books that I like I think oh, I should bookmark that should I I don't have I don't and I'm like I don't want to draw on the book yet I don't want to I don't want to earmark it you know dog ear it and it's like oh I'll, I'll remember it I'll remember it. and I never I never remember exactly where it is so <laughs> it's <laughs> I I think I need to have like a notebook by my side or in my pocket every time that I'm reading this just so I can mark down pages of um of quotes that I like But, um, yeah, there, it, the, the language is very poetic, very metaphorical. Again, another, another, uh, very musical, very musical. And that's where I would say it also is kind of very James Joyce inspired. Um, uh, I can read this part. The long corridor outside shines like the leather of a new shoe that walks and walks upon itself in a ghost footstep upon its own shining until it reaches the room where the women wait in night clothes for the nine o'clock terror called electric shock treatment they wear dressing gowns of red flannel as if god or the devil had purchased a continent of cloth and walked with scissors for stick from coast to coast to cut the dead mass pattern of mad men and women whose eyes will spring blind with sight of the world their world and the flag of cloth hung in the shape of the sun across their only sky and yes electroshock treatment is is part of this uh and the author was actually subjected to that as part of her autobiography which again this is not but it's pretty close it's pretty close i have to think it looked like oh the name the name of the book by the way owls do cry comes from shakespeare's play the tempest it's from the, it's, it actually is the epitaph to start the book, and it is referenced multiple times in the writing itself. Maybe even to the point where you get tired, where it's a little over, 
emphasized because it's already the title of the book, you know. But it's where the bee sucks, there suck I. In a cowslip's bell I lie. There I couch when owls do cry. On the bat's back do I fly. After summer, merrily. And that's it. And it's, uh, I think it's explained at some point that it's supposed, it's supposed to be referencing like a fairy uh, that's kind of like hiding in a, in a flower where the bee sucks, right? It, um, and, and, and the fairy sits there at night kind of way. So th there's, there's certainly a metaphor there that I have, I guess I haven't thought about it deep. There was one point when I was thinking about it, but I couldn't tell you like the idea of a, of a, of a fairy sitting in, um, in a flower at night uh i don't i don't know the play of the tempest i'm sure that i'm sure that the plot of the tempest would actually be a major clue to this book and i actually started listening to the tempest and and read a little bit of the structure and i was thinking about it but i can't remember it and i can't talk intelligently about it right now so um, i'm not going to try but there you go if you enjoy shakespeare you have a connection there. It also references um, a book from South Africa that's considered the like the the greatest work of South Africa, which is Alan Patton's oh, crap uh, in a something country. I'm gonna be reading it for this project. So Alan Patton, God, I hope that's his name. Um, I'm going to be reading the, pro the, the book for South Africa uh, that this book mentions for this project at some point. So uh, whatever it, it look up Alan Patton. I'm pretty sure that's his name. It's his most famous book. Mentions a, a few other things. Uh, Emily Bronte, Wuthering Heights, which I'm probably also going to be reading uh, shortly. For this project once halloween fall season comes around because they say it's a good autumn book so uh the i'll be reading that one and it's mentioned in here and then also jane irie is uh also you know more of the maybe not jane irie but definitely more of the um bronte sisters are mentioned in this book so that gives you an idea too of like who janet frames influences might be uh i've rambled enough <laughs> this is good for the video I think I was just trying to extend it, honestly, but hopefully that was some interesting information that uh, might make you want to read it. Uh, very unique book. I don't know if I emphasized its uniqueness enough. Never read anything like it. Uh, the the way it treats mental illness, and actually, yeah, I'll, I'll finish with this. The way I think it treats um, mental illness really shows how different people thought about mental illness in the 1950s. Like when this lobotomy stuff was going on, electroshock treatment, they didn't even have a word for epilepsy, it seemed like back then. They just called it fits. Uh, or epileptic fits maybe came into terminology around then, but it was relatively new if it did exist. And um, it just... You're, you're just seeing like psychiatry and psychology really in its infancy because we didn't really understand much of the brain at that point and maybe we still don't but the it really was an an, an underdeveloped and it, uh, uh, field of science at that point if you could even call it that so it, it's kind of frightening in a way it, it, the book and um and uh, makes you appreciate the people out there that are working to understand, um, uh, you know, people with with psych psychological or um, disorders, you know, or um, um, issues, problems, and uh, really just who they are. Understanding them on the level that of of who they are, and not uh, just seeing the problem of the person, but but especially in the case of Janet Frame, the, the creativity she had to offer the world and, and the novels she wrote, um, this being one that is absolutely worth reading. So I hope you've enjoyed the video and um, look forward to continuing with the next one.
Uh, thank you for watching, subscribing, liking, whatever you do. And we'll be back next time with Mike Reads the World. Thanks again. Signing off.